Hey there. Welcome to Stat's first installment of our 2022 Status, Lit, Status List Spotlight series, sponsored by YouTube. Thanks for joining us. I'm Nick St. Fleur, a general assignment reporter and associate editorial director of events here at Stat and host of a podcast called Color Code. And I'm sure you all know how to use Zoom by now. YouTube. But before we Thanks get started, us. a few quick housekeeping items. At the bottom of your screen, you should see several icons. Use the chat feature to chat amongst yourselves or to send a message directly to the stat team. Please do not put your questions for us in the chat. But if you do have questions, and we really hope you do have some questions, please use the Q&A feature to type your question and we'll try to answer them live. In the Q&A window, you should also be able to see the questions that other attendees have asked and upvote the questions you most like to see answered. We'll be taking questions throughout the chat, so please don't wait until the end to submit. This is part of what makes these live events so fun, so be sure to put in any questions you have. We definitely want to hear from you, and thanks again for being here. Before we get started, I'd like to welcome Garth Graham, MD, MPH, and Di Director and Global Head of YouTube Health for a sponsored introduction of today's event. Please note that these remarks have been pre-recorded. Hi everyone, I'm excited to be here with you today to hear from Drs. Oni and Uchi Blackstock. Like both Drs. Oni and Uchi Blackstock, I've also focused the majority of my career in, in medicine in advancing the causes of health equity. I'm in particular, I've focused a lot of my, my academic research and my time in government and in other areas around looking at this issue around social determinants of health. And now you may be thinking, like, that's great, Garth, but what does YouTube have to do with health? And how is the video side supposed to help deliver better care to patients? And how are videos going to help with health equity? And it really connects back to this issue around determinants of health and the things that are driving and helping to drive health outcomes and the importance of information and information quality and how information plays a role um, in the lives and the decisions that um, our communities are making on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, there's been all kinds of literature looking at the impact of housing and food insecurity and how those determinants uh, drive health outcomes. And part of what we're seeing, particularly with the COVID pandemic, is the importance of information and how information and the way people get information and the way they act in information um, has been a really important part of their decision making. It's been that way um, all along. And we need to consider where and how people access information about their health the quality of the health information, how easy it is to understand, and how engaging it is, and how much they relate to it so that um, they believe it and act on it and understand it um, in terms of that engagement overall. As I said before, you know, the reality, the majority of healthcare decisions are made outside the doctor's office um, on a minute by minute, um, hour by hour, day by day basis. And as healthcare providers, we often aren't able to connect um, with uh, uh, you know, our community and, and patients um, in that way, as people are living their daily lives. Um, the important part to understand is how can we be a part of the patient's journey, particularly outside of the clinical setting. And YouTube is already a part of the patient's journey. You know, they turn to platforms like ours for answers on health questions, um, to look up um, you know, communities and, and look up the experiences of other people who may be going through similar challenges to help give them um, a sense of that, that community, that experience, that, um, that ability to understand um, how they make the right decisions for themselves and many times for their families. And, you know, health education therefore comes in many forms nowadays. And we've seen just first firsthand just how powerful um, video can be um, as a medium to reach people and empower them with the ability to make the right decisions um, for themselves and their, their family. And that's why our mission for YouTube Health is to provide equitable access to high quality credible information that is evidence-based, but also culturally relevant and engaging. And that's really particularly important to us. And this approach um, allows us um, at globally, um, as you know, the healthcare community, um, to tackle the very serious issue of medical misinformation. So we're focusing on two particular areas, health equity, as I alluded to and mentioned before, but also information quality. And I'd like to share a little bit more about how we're doing that. Um, and, you know, and how partners are engaging with us um, on that journey. Because as health leaders, we really have a responsibility to keep pace with the changes that are happening and how people are getting information. And as I said before, you know, really be a part of their overall journey. And as an example, um, uh, we did some work with the American Academy of Pediatrics 
um, using um, YouTube Shorts, which is short form uh, video. Um, and they use this in a really creative way to educate um, a young woman about uh, health challenges they may be facing and how to kind of um, assess those challenges, understand those challenges, but again, make the right decision for them um, as, as individuals. Um, and connecting around this idea about um, understanding changes in their life, changes in their body, and again, you know, how to do it in a way that's both engaging and culturally relevant. And so um, health information tailored to communities has been particularly important. So it's an exciting time um, to be working on health communications with more tools available than we did before. Um, I'm personally excited about what we can collectively all do together. Um, and I'm excited even more um, to learn uh, today from Drs. Oni and Uchi Blackstock. And I hope that I might be able to um, you know, help encourage many of you all um, um, to be on the similar journeys um, that we're all on in terms of empowering communities. So um, thank you for having me and uh, let me turn this over um, to others uh, to take this from here. Hey, thank you for those remarks, Garth. Um, so here to join me for today's discussion, please welcome two members of the 2022 STAT status list. Dr. Oni Blackstock, founder and executive director of Health Justice, and her sister, Dr. Uche Blackstock, founder and CEO of Advancing Health Equity. Hello. Hello. Thanks so much for having us. Thanks of course. For us. No, I'm so happy to have you both as, as well. Let me start off by saying congratulations on, on being part of the status list. And let me also say uh, happy Mother's Day. Um, I hope you both had a, had a particularly fun one. <laughs> Yeah, we did. We actually were spent it together at Uche's place with our, our kiddos um, and our dad. So it was a, a, a joyous and, and pretty loud and ruckus time with the three, nine and under running around. No, that's fantastic. That's fantastic to hear. And one thing I'd love to do to kind of start off this conversation, and I'd also like to remind our viewers, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat and I'll be sure to ask them throughout our conversation. But, you know, uh, Along this theme of, of, of Mother's Day, I'd love to hear a bit about um, you know, your early lives and in particular, your mother, um, Dr. Dale Blackstock. Tell us a bit about her, her influence on your life and, and what it was like you know, growing up in Brooklyn. Go ahead, Oni. <laughs> Um, yeah, well, you know, it's so funny um, that you mentioned growing up in Brooklyn because our mom was a Brooklyn girl born and bred. Um, and so, you know, she lived most of her life in Brooklyn, except for the few years that she left to go to Boston for medical school. Um, so we came in you know, in the late 1970s and we were in 1977. And so when she came back from med school, um, she and my dad bought a, a place in Bedford-Stuyvesant Crown Heights, and we spent the first 18 years um, of our, our life there. And, um, you know, Crown Heights was a really wonderful place to um, grow up. I mean, there was a lot, a lot going on in terms of, um, you know, the, the crack ep epidemic. And at the same time, there were, you know, families, um, churches, community groups that were very much invested in, you know, creating a sense of, of, of community um, and connection there. So I think we had a really wonderful childhood, spent a lot of time at Prospect Park, um, at the Brooklyn Children's Museum, which is a few blocks down from where we grew up, uh, from um, the Brooklyn Botanical Garden. So I think we had a, the quintessential um, Brooklyn upbringing. Yeah, I just want to add, um, actually, today would have been our mother's 72nd birthday. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and so for people who don't, who don't know about her, you know, so she, your mom, as Oni said, you know, she probably got like 15 minutes from where I am right now um, in, in poverty to a single mom. Um, she had five, five siblings and really had a very challenging upbringing, but um, our mother was incredibly determined and she was, she was, I think, just naturally gifted, smart person. And um, in college, at Brooklyn College, she ended up having a chemistry professor there who saw her potential and said, you need to, you should apply to medical school. And it was something that she hadn't really thought about because um, earlier on in her life, when she had brought it up to one of her teachers, um, her teacher said to her, um, the only thing that you're going to probably be the best at is a social worker. 
um, and not a doctor. So, so she had been discouraged, but this professor really was incredibly supportive and she ended up applying to medical school, was accepted to every single medical school she applied to and ended up matriculating um, at Harvard Medical School. And so obviously that was a culture shock for her because she was in class there with kids whose parents were on faculty. One of this, one of her um, classmates' um, father had just won the Nobel Prize. So, you know, so then here she is, like, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm little Dr. Uh, little Dale Blackstock from, from Brooklyn, and, and I'm the first person in my family to graduate from college and to even go to medical school. So that was such a shock for her. But I think, you know, again, she's just so incredibly um, determined. She had a very strong work ethic. But even more so, um, after medical school, she was one, very, one of the very few not to stay in Boston or um, go to an Ivy League um, uh, affiliated residency program. She came back to, um, to, to New York City to train at Harlem Hospital in internal medicine. And that was a huge, huge move for her. You know, she could have, she could have stayed at Harvard, but she felt indebted to serve um, communities or similar communities in, in which she grew up in. Yeah, and, and just to add that our mom was part of the first wave of uh, medical students um, that were recruited as a result of affirmative action. So she started medical school in the late 70s, and it was in the late 60s that schools like um, Harvard Medical School started in earnest being intentional about their efforts um, to rec recruit um, Black and, and Latino students. So it was really wonderful. She was a fish out of water, but she was also part of, you know, this cohort, this new cohort of of black medical students that were really, you know, making their, um, you know, themselves known and establishing themselves. And so I think in many ways she was, you know, at the, at the vanguard and at the forefront of a lot of the changes um, that happened in medicine over those decades. Wow. Wow. Thank you so much for, for sharing, you know, her story and, um, you know, happy, happy birthday to her as well. Um, and you said she went to, to Brooklyn College. Funny enough, that's where my dad went. And <laughs> you both had mentioned the botanical gardens. My my so both my parents grew up in Brooklyn as well. My mom spent hours every week at the botanical garden. So that's so great to hear. Um, so you had mentioned, you know, she went on to, to Harvard Medical School and you both went there as well. Tell us a bit about your experiences there and your experiences going to the same medical school as your mother. Yes. So, you know, I think, you know, as Uchi was mentioning, our mother, when she went, you know, her experience was very much of that of uh, being like a fish out of water. Um, I think, you know, for us, you know, we were coming from Harvard undergrad. So we'd kind of, you know, had a sense of what these institutions um, are like, and particularly navigating them as Black women. And then, um, you know, going to Harvard Medical School, I think we were probably more in the know in terms of like what, what, what to anticipate. But that, but that being said, you know, medical school is still um, you know, very challenging. Um, and one of the positive things is Harvard Med does a pretty good job with recruiting, um, you know, Black and Latino and Indigenous students. So we had a really good representation in both of our classes um, of, the, of those students and really felt like it was an opportunity to just grow and explore. So I personally um, developed an interest in HIV and global health. So spent time in, in Ghana and South Africa and was able to find really wonderful mentors who I'm still in touch with now who have really helped me to like shape my career and my trajectory. Um, but you know, th these are, you know, these are challenging places, you know, as, as black people, as, as black women, um, and, you know, had, you know, different instances, um, you know, you know, on the wards, you know, where people, you know, assume that you're not a medical student, they assume that maybe you're, your transport. I remember one, yeah, I, I remember one, I was like, how, when does transport wear a stethoscope around their neck? But I think, you know, a lot of times people see, you know, a black person, they assume that they're in a certain position. And just to say transport, incredibly important, critically important to what all that we do within the hospitals, you know, our patients need to get from point A to point B. Um, that being said, you know, I, I know many of our colleagues who, you know, aren't white or aren't women don't have to, you know, deal with sort of being, mm -hmm. you know, mistaken for other members of the, of the medical team. Yeah, so, so yes, I would just carry on and say, I, I do think that our experience is very different from from our mothers, just because we had been in that sort of environment um, before. And I have to say that overall, I mean, Harvard Medical School I, was a very positive experience. Um, you know, when, when we attended there, there was a, the New Pathway Program. At the time, it was the New Pathway Program. So they'd done away with grading, um, especially during the first two years. And the focus was, you know, it was, was pass-fail. So you really could 
focus on learning, learning the content, loving the content. Um, and, and, I, and I think overall for most students, it was a, it was a positive um, experience. You know, when our mom relayed some stories to us from medical school, she told us it was much, um, when we were younger, um, it was much more competitive in that if there was a test, and, there, and the textbook would be in the library. Why, uh, what, what was the name of the library, Oni? Is it what? Countway. Countway, it Countway. That some of her classmates would tear up the pages out of the textbook um, before a test so that only certain people would have access to that material. Oh. Yes. And, 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 they, and she mentioned they would steal like your to toiletries, like steal her toothpaste and things like that to kind of like knock you off of your game. It was like very competitive. I know. I know. So, wow. yeah, so, so really different, but also what's really wonderful. And I, and I don't know if people in the audience um, know this, you know, our mother, she actually, she passed away when we were in college, um, when we were 19 years old from acute myelogenous leukemia. Um, and that was obviously such um, a shock to us because she really was very healthy, vibrant person. Our mom ran um, every day, she ran about 40 miles a week. Um, we would actually run races with her, road races in Central Park together. And that's how we found out that she was um, ill because we'd run uh, a six mile race, a 10K together in Central Park uh, the summer before our, I think it was our, our sophomore year. And our mother came in behind us. And even though she was in her 40s, she would, and we were teens, she would always come in, um, you know, before us. So, so we were, what's going on? And she ended up getting worked up for fatigue and um, eventually being diagnosed with acute myelogenous um, leukemia. And so obviously at that point, we were still pre-med in, in college, but I, you know, and, you know, we were always still going to go to medical school, but I definitely think, you know, that experience of, her diagnosis of having to come, we would come down on the weekends from Boston to stay with her in her hospital room. Um, she was getting her care at uh, a Wild Cornell Hospital. Um, you know, it was really, I, I, it was very, it was actually very traumatic. It was, it was a really difficult, difficult time. And I think um, for our mother as a physician, and then being a patient, and and you know, and and, and getting chemotherapy and and going the disappointment of of of, of not bone marrow not responding to the chemotherapy to the point where she could have a bone marrow transplant. That was really difficult to see. Um, and I think for her as a physician and knowing what's going on, this, this, I think especially hard to know kind of the science and to know the medicine um, of it all. So I know for me, you know, when, when, when I eventually finished medical school and started caring for patients, that experience um, really shaped the kind of physician um, that I wanted to be um, as, as well. Just thinking about, you know, your patients come to you when they are most in need and, you know, worried and anxious and, and their families are going through this painful, painful experience. So, you know, I think we all have our stories. We all have our stories of what shapes us. Um, and for, I think for both Oni and me, and I, I could say it for Oni that, you know, our mother's illness and, and losing her when we we're only 19 years old um, really has shaped kind of what the, you know, the legacy that we'd like to, um, to continue for her. Um, yeah, yeah, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> you know, I was just going to say that I, I always remember, you know, when she was mentioning, we would come down from Boston to visit her in the hospital. And I remember we would sleep over when we would take turns sometimes. And um, I remember that the medical team would come in, they would be rounding in the morning, which is, you know, typically happens with people in the hospital. And I remember they would come in, they would like turn on the light. This is like 6 a.m. in the morning. And then they would just take the sheets off of her to like examine her. And, and, and she had lost a lot of weight. She was very emaciated. Um, she, you know, she was very cold often as a result of the anemia that she had due to her leukemia. And I always remember that. And so when I would, you know, was a resident, when I was an attending, I would always be like, when we'd come into rooms to see patients, I would just be like, let's be really quiet. I would make sure I would not order, um, often we order lab tests, blood tests early in the morning so that we have them in time for rounds. And I was like, I don't want us drawing lab work on any patients five, six o'clock in the morning, they're trying to rest. Like there are just so many lessons that I learned that, you know, just from observing, you know, medical, the medical team interacting with our mom. And even though she was a physician, she was, you know, when you're, it, you're a patient, you're, you're treated often, you know, times like, um, you know, you're not treated with the same respect all the time um, mm -hmm. as someone maybe in a different position. So, and, and just to also say the leukemia that our mom got was, a leuke leukemia that typically like elderly people or much older people get. Um, and I remember they said, and Uchi probably knows more about this, that her, her DNA, like the mutations that she had 
looked the like she had been the karyotype looked like she had been exposed to radiation like these high levels of radiation we think maybe during at some point during her training she was exposed to radiation mm. but it's also got us thinking a lot about just the stresses of being a black woman in the world and medicine and how that could have potentially yeah. contributed yeah. And, and also this idea of, of environmental racism, because our mom grew up in, in poverty, and we know that there, there's, and it's documented that there's certain er neighborhoods in, in New York City and in, in Brooklyn that actually had, you know, there, were there was toxic dumping in them, um, you know, in the 50s and the 60s, you know, when, when my mother was growing up. So, you know, we don't know exactly why, but the, the again, like as Oni said, the kind of leukemia that she had was actually it's myelodysplastic syndrome that converted into acute myelogenous leukemia it's very 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 rare wow wow no no thank you thank you both so much for 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 uh, you know sharing all of that with us um goodness it, it just gives you so much to, to think about and I mean I'm just getting emotional hearing you yeah. both as well um so before we we shift talking a bit about um you know your both of your careers and such I'd love to also give an opportunity to speak about your dad a bit. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so our, our parents, they met at, so our parents both ended up at Brooklyn College, mm -hmm. but they started out at, um, I can't remember what the name of the college was. It was, it was downtown Brooklyn. It was another, another it was like, it was like a community college. college. Um, and they met there. And so our, our dad um, immigrated from the U.S., I mean, from Jamaica to the U.S. when he was 17 years old. Um, and his mother actually had had come here years before and actually had, had her own family. Um, his dad um, sometimes was, was a salesman and so in Jamaica. And so he was a traveling salesman and so often was traveling around the island selling his wares. So he was raised by a lot of older women um, in, the, in his community. Um, and so anyway, when he was 17, he immigrated here. He entered um, the, the army. He worked a host of lots of different jobs, including like as director of a methadone maintenance center here in Harlem. Um, he actually ended up going to um, Baruch, um, one of the city, um, you know, one of the city college here, um, a city university here in New York City um, to get his MBA. And he spent the majority of his career at um, the Department of Education here in New York City, um, working as an accountant and in and, and various like supervisory um, roles. So it, it was, it's really wonderful growing up because we had like our mom is sort of like the black American, African-American influence. Most of her family's from, from the South and our dad sort of brings in that Jamaican influence. And so where we grew up in Crown Heights, I think over time, you know, sort of changed from, shifted mm -hmm. from a black American to Afro-Caribbean area. Yes. Um, but, you know, our parents, I think both had, you know, the, sh the values that they shared with us were really around you know, service to our community, the importance of equity and justice. When we were growing up, they took us to um, anti-apartheid marches mm -hmm. at the UN. We went out to Howard Beach, um, you know, when the, um, the, the incident happened where the, the young black men, or at least one or I don't know if multiple were, were murdered, anti-police brutality marches, all this stuff when we were younger. So I think, you know, all of that exposure, you know, really um, instilled in us a sense of, um, you know, service and, and duty to our community and uplifting our community and the importance of advancing um, equity and justice and all that yeah. we do. And I just wanted to share like this story that our dad tells us because, you know, he, because he's from Jamaica, which is, you know, which is a black, mostly black country, this idea of race was something that he never really thought about until he came to the U.S. And he, as Oni mentioned, he was in the army for a few years and he was stationed in, in Texas and he was with his, um, you know, his peers. They were going into a bar in Texas. This was probably in um, late 19, late 1950s, early 1960s. And um, he was going through the front door with them and someone, a worker in the bar stopped him and said, where are you going? And he said, I'm going in the bar with my, you know, his, his, his friends, his white friends who are also in the army. And he said, he said, he said, no, you have to go through the back. And for my dad, that was, um, you know, obviously he was so hurt and humiliated by that. But I think that was a moment in his life that really shifted um, his own sense of, of who he was, his own identity of kind of w w what he was here in the U.S. versus, you know, back in Jamaica, um, something that he had never really thought about, right? But then when, it when racism showed up, it really had sort of, I think, influenced 
even sort of how he raised us and our sense of, 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 who, of who we are um, as well. But that was a very painful, a painful experience for him. And he still, he still talks about it. He yeah. still really talks about it because it really was a shock to the system for him. And just, and just to add, our parents in the 70s are part of um, sort of the pan-African movement, you know, just increasing awareness in terms right. of like our roots and being proud of who we are. So they actually, so they gave us the names that we have. Our names are... Um, my name is a Yoruba name, um, Uche's name is an Igbo name, and our middle names are also um, African names. And we also went to this, uh, our nursery school was called Little Sun People, and it was actually housed in this brownstone in Bedford-Stuyvesant um, that our, our dad's um, mother owned and actually ended up selling. And so we ended up, this is a strange connection, just ended up going to nursery school here, but it, there, but it was just really instilled in us a sense of, you know, loving ourselves and being proud of who we are and being proud of our community. Oh, no, that is that is fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, just a quick reminder to the audience, if you have questions, feel free to put them in the Q&A and I'll be sure we get to discuss them here. Um, now, shifting a bit to some of the pivotal moments in, in your lives. Uh, tell us a bit about ex your experiences, um, you know, leaving academic medicine, um, but also you both do work, you run businesses uh, focused on, on racial uh, inequity and healthcare. Tell us a bit about what those have been like those experiences, the work you're doing now. Yeah, you, you know, it's interesting because I think because our mother was in academics for so long, I, I thought my career would be in academia for forever. If, if someone had told me maybe five years ago, oh, you're going to leave academia and start your own company and be a social impact entrepreneur, I would say, oh, never. But, you know, but it was my own experience within, you know, I think there are a lot of really wonderful aspects of, of academic environments, sort of like the stimulating um, the learning environment, the innovation that happens, um, the research, um, the, the teaching, the clinical work, that sort of, that, that, that perfect like trifecta, right? That you can't really find anywhere else. Um, but I also think, especially within academic medicine, it, it's a very conservative environment. Um, I think people like to think that they're especially innovative, <laughs> but not, 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 not so much. And I think for me, in terms of having a voice, I, was, I, I wasn't able really to show up as my full authentic self. And what I realized is that really the only way to do that was to really create my, develop my, and found my own company that would work um, as an external consultant with, with academic organizations or other healthcare related organizations to do work around racial equity um, and health equity. Um, and so do I think that I think there are some organizations that are very much willing to change. I think there, there's some others that are very, very resistant, but it's been interesting um, leaving academia, which I think for many people when they, they saw, I was associate professor, I had multiple titles. Um, and I think on the outside, superficially, people looked at me and said, oh, wow, she's incredibly successful. Um, she should be so happy. But the fact is, is that I wasn't because I wasn't really able to speak up about the issues that I really, um, that really, concerned me without feeling like I would be retaliated against or, um, you know, something bad, <laughs> something negative would happen. And so, you know, now, now we, I have my own company doing this really wonderful work and working with organizations who, for the most part, are interested in either changing, uh, making the workplace culture more equitable or how they deliver care uh, more equitable. And it's really, um, I would say reassuring at times to see that there are organizations that do want to do this really hard work. We often tell them that it's a marathon and not a sprint and that there needs to be really full commitment from the top down in terms of thinking about strategic plans, um, thinking about um, really the long term and how, how, do, you, how do you integrate equity um, into how an organization runs or how care is delivered and, and being really forward thinking about it as well. Yeah, and so I, I was in academia as well for about 10 years. I was on more of the, the research side. So I was doing NIH, CDC funded um, HIV research um, at an academic medical center. And um, it was, you know, for the most part, it was, it was incredibly um, rewarding. But what I noticed was that, so my focus was on HIV, particularly among Black and Latina women. And I would get reviews back um, on my grant proposals from NIH reviewers saying, we don't really think that this is a, a big issue, HIV for black women. Meanwhile, black women account for 60% of new HIV diagnoses, Latina women about um, 20 or 30%. Um, and so I'm getting this message you know, from funders um, that 
um, the, the people that I'm studying, the, the issues I'm studying are not important. I remember actually submitting a proposal um, to the CDC um, around an intervention that I was creating to connect uh, cisgender and transgender women to HIV prevention. And out of a cohort of folks, um, I, I was I, my, my proposal was selected for funding, but out of eight people, I was the only one um, who's, who's, who did not end up, who had to wait a year to get their funding. Um, mm. And so things were sort of uncertain for a while. And I was the only one who had a proposal focused on women. <laughs> mm. So I was just getting a lot of these messages that the population of the communities that I was interested in, um, you know, just weren't worth the investment um, by the NIH. And I was also involved, like each in a lot of also um, in an un- official capacity diversity work at this um, academic medical center with recruiting and retaining medical residents. Mm-hmm. And I realized I was un- completely untitled. I was completely mm-hmm. uncompensated. Right. I was doing this because it was, it, it, it mattered to me. Mm-hmm. Um, but I started it's almost like, like a tax. Yeah. I was like, this is ridiculous. Why am I? And I, you know, and my, you know, and, and the salaries in academia are actually, I mean, just relatively low compared to if mm-hmm. someone's working in like clinical, you know, practice, private practice, or at um, you know other types of hospitals. So I actually ended up getting a message via Facebook from a friend who was an HIV activist who said. Oni, I know you have this whole research career. You're super. You're, you're doing really well, but there's an opening at the New York City Health Department to lead the Bureau of HIV. So leading the city's response to the HIV epidemic, and I said, like, why not? And the, why not? Let me just try this out. Let me just see. And it, it, you know, and it was like an amazing. I went from managing a team of two research staff to managing a department of like 300 plus people. I was like, oh my goodness. Oh, but that was, but it was such, it was the most amazing experience because I learned about more about, um, and I think she talks about this compassionate leadership, like how we can lead, but mm-hmm. we can lead in a way where there's like, that's inclusive, that respects everyone, that recognizes everyone. And I, and I think, you know, Uti and I have not seen a lot of that modeled. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think I didn't realize my impact until I left the health department when people said to me, we've never had an assistant commissioner say hello. We've never, to us, to call me by my name, We've never had anybody, um, you know, recognize us. So for instance, if we had a campaign, I would, I would say, yes, thank you to the director of, of our social um, marketing um, unit. You know, I would make sure right. I, it's a team, it's all a team sport. Um, so that was a really wonderful experience for me, but I was, and I'm going to, I'm going to wrap up in a second, but I was continually undermined in my role, mm-hmm. unfortunately, mm-hmm. as one of the few black women in leadership at the New York city health department, um, mm-hmm. I wasn't able to fully inhabit my role. And, and like Uche, you know, Uche was starting her business. And, you know, I think this idea of creating a space or a counter space um, in which we could sort of, we could, we, could, we could embed our values and lead in the way that we want to and make the change that we want to. And that led me to starting um, Health Justice. No, that's that's fantastic. It really is. I, I, I want to turn over to some questions we have here. And I'd like to remo- remind our um, our viewers, if you have a question, please put it in the Q&A so that I'll be sure to see it there. Um, so the first question we have comes from Carl Johnson, who says, great insights. As we categorize factors that impact health equity into structural sl- slash systemic community and personal level aspects, how do you prioritize deciding which structural slash systemic factors like transportation, housing, education, employment, et cetera, et cetera, to tackle and identify the resources to address? So there's a whole lot of issues going on when we uh, talk about structural and systemic like changes or structural and uh, systemic equity. How do you pick what to focus on? How do you pick on what to tackle and identify? Oh, and you can go, Oni. Oh, no, and I was just going to say, um, I, I would, it's, it's, it's hard to choose one. I mean, I think, it, it, I think what that question emphasizes is just how important all of the, you know, uh, included in those, you know, obviously the social determinants of health. And we've seen how in the pandemic, how, how systemic racism can be a key driving force of the social determinants of health. We, you know, many of us already knew that, right? Because there are, um, for, example, being, for example, housing discrimination laws like, the, like redlining from the 1930s that actually still impacts where we see racial health inequities um, in major cities throughout the country. So, uh, you know, during the pandemic, I actually um, had the opportunity um, to actually testify a few times, but I testified in front of the subcommittee um, on the coronavirus pandemic for the racial health inequity um, I'm hearing. And, and what, I, and what I, I testified about is that we really need to address all of the social determinants of health, right? We need to look at not only um, opportunities for 
safe and affordable housing, but looking at opportunities for how do we improve um, educational opportunities for Black communities and other communities um, of, of color? How do we improve trans transportation? How do we improve um, the ability to, to, to accumulate wealth as, as well? So there are so many different um, areas that I think also policy needs to impact. And so I think there are things, you know, the question asked about this, so things obviously on an interpersonal level that we can do. I always tell, and only I talk about this a lot, that we ask, you know, our, our white colleagues and our non and our non-black colleagues to really think about think about their privilege, think about how in their respective roles, whatever you do, whether it's your personal life or your professional life, how can you help amplify the voices of your black colleagues? How can you help to advocate on, on their behalf? Um, you know, um, if, if something happens at work, are you silence? Because silence is is is, is, com is complicity, especially in the face um, of racism. But I do, I, but I do ultimately think that we really need to impact policy, and and, and policy is really the way that we can address some of these um, deficiencies in, in, the, in, the so, in the social determinants of health. And again, as I mentioned, the marathon and not the sprint. So we, I think people are looking for these quick fixes mm -hmm. and they're never going to be in quick fixes because we are over 400 years, 400 years in, 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 in this, right? Like the first sin, you know, of, of slavery in this country, we're still seeing um, the remnants of that. And I know that it, it may not be as obvious to a lot of people, but it's still very much here in terms of, you know, when we look at all the social institutions, the criminal legal system, the educational system, the healthcare system, when we look at racial health inequities, I mean, the fact that maternal health, uh, maternal mortality rates have worsened over the last few years, and that's driven by Black women and Indigenous women, you know, we have, we really have, there's so much self-reflection that not only we have to do as individuals in this country, but organizations and how organizations are complicit. So um, again, I, I really do think that we have to think about how do we create a healthcare um, environment that is structurally competent, that understands how the fact that we have you know policies and the fact that the kind of economic system we have a capitalist system how that does impact mm -hmm. the social determinants of health and ultimately um, more downstream the health outcomes that we care so deeply about thank you uh, we have a question here from from junior uh, bazell um, who asks to what extent um, does the work that you both do in both of your organizations you know cross or meet each other do you ever collab <laughs> Yeah, oh, yeah. Yes. You know, definitely. So, so just to say, we both have, um, I, I, I like to describe my company as a racial and health equity um, consulting firm. I think Uche describes it as a health equity consulting firm, but it, it working towards the same goals. And so what we typically do often, in, in addition to speaking engagements, is deliver um, trainings often to healthcare and public health staff. Um, as well as conducting organizational equity assessments that provide organizations with a baseline understanding of sort of where they're at, they are on their equity um, journey. So we do have opportunities sometimes to work together. For instance, we work together to develop um, a provider training around um, motivational interviewing for providers when talking to patients about um, the COVID uh, 19 vaccine. Um, and then when we have opportunities come up, you know, Uche will tell me about one, I'll tell her about them. Um, but we're, we're but basically we're working in tandem to really help organizations in particular to shift um, in terms of, um, you know, centering, centering equity, um, making this a priority. And I know that um, I think someone had someone had asked in terms of like, Oh, I think the last question in terms of like what to work on and just to say like everything needs to be worked on <laughs> like because these are systems right and they all the parts are interconnected and interrelated. Um, I do I do say that I think the work we do organizationally is is probably the, the most important because I think behavior change is important but once you know there are different norms and cultural values that are established in an organization people need to, to go with that. We have um, another question here from from Pringle Miller, um, and I just want to say thank you both for your your insights on the, those past two questions. Um, Pringle says, "I'm not witnessing a genuine effort on the part of healthcare systems and academic medical centers to advance DEI and anti racism within culture and in delivery of patient care. What glimmers of hope can you share with us, being on the front lines of, of this work? So, what 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 keeps you hopeful?" I, can I can I just I, can I just say you know I think in particular for folks in healthcare I think mm -hmm. a lot of people who are in the field whether it's health public health whatever they tend to think of themselves as 
progressive. They think often, you know, we're doing work around health inequities out there in the communities that we serve. But there is um, often a reluctance to examine the way the, these same systems that um, create and perpetuate inequities. We, there's, a, there's a hesitancy to interrogate how those show up within academic institutions or healthcare institutions or public health institutions. So um, that being said, um, you know, the process is incredibly you know, messy. For instance, I worked with an organization that when I shared with them the results of this organizational equity assessment that we did, I got anger. Um, the leadership was very upset. They questioned the rigor of the methods. And I thought, oh my goodness, like they're not going to use any of the stuff that we that we said that, that I recommended. But the way it works, you know, there's the storming, norming, all this stuff. Like people are going through a process. And so about a month or two later, you know, I hear updates. They're, 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 they're actually convening um, groups. People are talking, are starting to tackle, you know, some of these different issues that they're seeing show up in terms of, you know, workforce equity or how patients are treated. Um, they're wanting me to come back for virtual training. So just to say, like, I think these shifts happen. They're not going to be, you know, they're not going to be huge. But I think if we can get folks going in the right direction, a lot of times people don't know what they need to do and they don't know what they don't know. And so that's why we're there to help provide them. Here are the strategies that you need. Here's what you need to do like providing those guideposts. And um, yeah, it, it's been um, heartening to, to see some of these organizations like take what we've provided them in terms of like recommendations for an equity plan and to begin implementing them. And we know that there aren't gonna be a lot of, you know, major changes happening immediately, but there may be some small wins and there's gonna be, you know, a commitment to working towards those larger wins. Mm -hmm. And Oni, you, you said a little bit about the, the, the challenges, but also the kind of, you know, anger or frustration when it comes, um, on the part of, you know, maybe your, your client's part when it comes to doing this work, because, uh, you know, changing systems, is, it, it, it's tough. It's tough. And not every system wants to change. And that kind of leads into this next question we have here from uh, Tino Della Merced, who is actually um, an intern on the Color Code team and an MD student. Um, so Tino asks, so inspiring to get to hear from you both, um, Uche and Oni. Retaliation is a very real thing in academia when it comes to health equity and justice work. What advice would you give to health profession, uh, health profession students about bringing their health equity and justice perspective to academic spaces? Yeah, so yeah, I would love to answer that because so today I was just thinking about the students um, and, and really the students um, were who really um, inspired me to continue doing this work because and also this, this generation is so incredibly sophisticated in terms of their approach and, and, and their and their knowledge and I would say is find your find your people find find the people um, at your institution or you know you can collaborate with other institutions that care very very deeply about this work know that you um, have to keep on pushing and also find allies within the administration, like find it, faculty or staff, they are out there and they are there and they will, they will support you and know that this work is incredibly important. And I know often the students, and this is what we actually, I've actually seen our organizational assessments with academic medical centers that the students actually have to carry a large burden of mm -hmm. pushing these DEI efforts forward. And part of the work that we do is really you know, turning a mirror on the organizations and saying, no, you cannot have the students do all the work and then take credit for it. You, mm -hmm. you need to put systems, resources, people in place to actually do this hard work. This is work that a whole team of people should be doing and should be integrated into everyone's roles. But with that said, yes, retaliation is, is, is real, but we, but we really are trying to push organizations to a point where we want our students to show up as their full authentic selves. We want them to be able to say what's on their mind and, and, and share their perspectives. And I know that it's we're not there yet. Um, but again, find find your people, whether it's other students or people in the administration who can help support you and have your back. Right. Yeah. yeah and just a quick thing, I know we're going to oh, finish, but just, right ahead. just like what Uche was saying, just so organizing is like a key mm -hmm. racial equity like principle. And so what Uche was saying in terms of like finding your people, because what that also helps um, prevent is scapegoating. Often if there are one mm -hmm. or two people who are speaking up, that those individuals then get scapegoated and they get problematized. But when there is a when you come together as a collective, it's much harder to do that. Mm -hmm. Now, shifting focus to you know the current landscape right now in in the U.S. with with the pandemic, we we've just reached 
a million COVID deaths. Um, I know some of my colleagues here at STAT have really put together a, a big package to kind of highlight, you know, what that means. But for, for both of you who, who are at the forefront of this work, have been doing this work in terms of health equity, looking at the, the, the disparities when it comes to COVID, uh, who's impacted and, and COVID deaths, what does this milestone, this, this, yeah. this honestly morbid milestone mean to both of you? And I just saw the email actually before I logged on from Rick Burke about all the all of the, the, the acknowledgement by STAT of this really um, unfortunate um, and tragic milestone. And I want to thank STAT for actually paying attention to this because I think that's another thing we, we need for the media to really emphasize like really this milestone is so incredibly grim. And also it's, I will say it's preventable and, 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 and people, some people will just disagree with that. But I think that we really need for our leadership to, to continue to center equity. Like in every policy decision, whether it's lifting, you know, lifting mask policies, changing vaccine requirements, you need to think about who is, are, how are the most vulnerable going to be impacted? Who's going to be disproportionately impacted by this change? You know, is this, is this fair, right? Um, and, and always center the, 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 the collective as well as the people that have been placed um, at risk. And so, yeah, this is horrible. I, I would have never thought um, in March 2020, when I started seeing patients with COVID-19 walk into my urgent care, that we would reach this grim milestone. Um, but I think that there are a lot of us out there that care very deeply about these numbers. And we know that not just numbers, they're human beings. Um, and, and that's why Oni and I continue to advocate um, and try to, you know, in our op-eds or in our television appearances, make sure that we continue to elevate the voices of, of communities that have been marginalized. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, no, there's been you know a great deal, I think, of complacency. And I think at the beginning of this pandemic, we would have never imagined, you know, reaching a million, or if we did, we would imagine that there would be some, you know, deep recognition, you know, of this um, you know, horrible grim milestone, as um, as Uche said. Um, but I think um, you know, what it really tells us is we we can it's really important, as Uche's saying, we get our, our voices out that we there it's it's documented that there are people who are like outraged. By what's by what's going on that we want to that we know that what's going on right now is again largely um, preventable. Um, it could have been prevented based, you know, if there was a difference in, in the policies and policies again that focus on um, the collective and really centered equity. Because when you lead with equity, like everybody, mm -hmm. everybody benefits. That's the, that's the thing. If you center the most vulnerable, everyone benefits. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's. Um, incredibly important and we, and we don't want to leave anyone behind like no one should ever be left behind you know in this in this country as we move forward no thank you thank you and only you um and speaking about making sure no one's left behind um i believe you had a recent op-ed talking a bit about you know leaders who are abandoning mass mandates right now could you share with us a bit about your, your thoughts on on what that means right now as well as you know we have treatments out right now but there's still unequal access to antivirals as well. T tell us a bit about your thoughts on those those two. Right. Issues. Yeah, and I and I, you know, I don't want this necessarily to be like just focus on mass. I know they've they've been made to be um, you know it's very controversial or um, you know hot topic. But this is just about what are the precautionary measures, what are the safety measures. These are like very modest interventions that that can really protect all of us, including folks who are immunocompromised and have underlying conditions. And so the op-ed that I wrote with um, my colleague Lucky Tran was really this whole idea that. You know, again, for instance, with masking on, on transportation, like, you know, we know that many people who are, you know, essential workers, you know, people who may be um, from, you know, households with lower incomes, they are the ones taking transportation. They're the ones also who have the least access to treatment, to testing. So what can we do to ensure all of these folks who keep, you know, our, our cities running are, are, are protected? And so we really, we're trying to drive home the point that, um, that actually, uh, you know, you, you know, um, uh, these, these safety measures actually allow us to keep society open. You know, if people are, are if everyone is masking to reduce transmission and transmission goes low, lower, we can actually keep our, all of our essential services open. Mm -hmm. People seem to think that these safety measures are equal to, um, you know, lock, locking down, which we've never done. It's really just about how do we allow everyone to go about their lives in a way that is safe for everyone. And so that's what we were, we were putting forward. We were saying, especially with cases increasing right now, not the time to um, drop these safety measures, but we know that it's really hard to re-implement them once they've been lifted. 
Thank you. Uh, we have some viewer questions here, and I want to make sure we can kind of get to them all. So I'm going to ask uh, if you can keep your, your responses a, a little brief yes. while yes. we have some time left here. Uh, the first one is from Francesca. Yes, I just have to close my window. I'm sorry. This is oh, go right ahead. Uh, the first one is from Francesca Colchera, who says, uh, great discussion. Could each of you name one health equity issue that you view as particularly important? Um, it could be a specific health issue or, or healthcare delivery issue or something that's overlooked. What, what do you feel in health equity is, is overlooked? And then we'll get to some of the other questions as well. But this isn't necessarily overlooked. And I feel like Uche touched on this a little earlier, but just, um, I mean, the fact that we don't have healthcare for all. I was going to say that. <laughs> yes. Okay. So yeah, we okay. actually, my colleagues and I, we have a, a, another op-ed coming out about the ending of the, um, the COVID, the program that provided free testing vaccines and treatment for people who are uninsured. I mean, this is, I mean, we're the only, you know, wealthy nation or high income nation that does not have insure healthcare um, for everyone. And we know that when people do not have health insurance, again, they're more likely to forego um, medical care. Um, we know that, again, medical debt is a common reason, um, you know, that folks are, are, are dealing with debt. So we actually know that if people are insured, it actually will help to reduce health inequities, and it will actually improve the overall health um, of our country. It's not the only thing that we need to do, but ensuring that all Americans have health insurance and mm. access to health care, I think, is a major issue. Thank yeah, and, and, and definitely, I was also going to say health insurance, mm. but, but I think, um, you know, access to health care, health insurance is a health equity issue. I think it, I think it is a racial equity issue, because mm -hmm. when you look at who is uninsured in, in this company is most, I mean, this country, it's mostly low income families. It's mostly black and brown people. Um, you know, it's, it, it, it's a lot of people between the ages of 18 and 34, right? And so these are people that we really, we, we need to take care of each other. And we, and we have the data, the economists have, have already shown that if we were actually were to have a single payer universal healthcare system, that we would actually save tremendous amount of, of, of money, especially in administrative costs, while improving the health and saving, saving 65,000 lives. Actually, there's one study that came out recently that said 65,000 people um, would, 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 would live because of single care universal health care. So that's something I feel strongly about. I actually testified in front of the House Oversight Committee um, last month about this, uh, about Medicare for all. But it's really something that, you know, we were one of the only high income countries that we don't have health insurance for, mm -hmm. for every citizen. And I think it is, a, it's a human right. I think it should be, um, and it's a racial and health equity issue. Thank you. Um, we have a question up here from um, uh, Lynn Philatrulet who says, how can we hold healthcare organizations to do this equity and justice work uh, accountable? Yeah. It seems like we need to tie performance metrics with, with yeah. uh, teeth to delivering actual results. Otherwise yeah. it will remain in flip service. So how do you keep people accountable? Yeah, it, it's, it sort of reminds me of, you know, how um, I remember there was um, this thing with reimbursement with healthcare institutions. Like if a patient got a hospital acquired infection, I think they had to, either, there was some penalty or something of that nature, or they were less, they got reimbursed less for the patient's care or something of that nature. But I think we need to actually try, like as Francesca was, I think it was, was it Francesca or someone was saying that um, we need to tie like health outcomes or healthcare outcomes to, to, to equity measures, to reimbursement, to incentives, because the reality is our healthcare system is, is for profit. You know, it's um, based on a capitalist model and that's a whole another discussion that, that we can have. Um, but we, what we need to do is, you know, in order for hospitals to get, you know, high rating on that leapfrog website, you know, show that they are providing or meeting the needs of different populations and different communities in a way that is helping to, to mitigate and reduce inequities that we see. But I do think in this country, in order for that to happen, things need to be linked to to money and reimbursement. Mm -hmm. I, think I, that, I think that's just the reality. We have a, a question here from Zubin da Costa. Um, in the fight against COVID-19, what were the barriers you saw within underserved communities uh, between patients and care slash vaccines? And, and what was your experience in addressing issues such as vaccine hesitancy? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I think that especially the issue with the with the back with vaccines and vaccine hesitancy, which I think has, I mean, I think the push to get people vaccinated, it feels like it's stalled a lot. But I think especially um, in Black communities, um, 
the vaccine hesitancy issue is not really talked about in a, in a nuanced way in that, you know, uh, social institutions like healthcare institutions and other institutions have, have historically proven untrustworthy, right, to, to Black communities, right? So then all of a sudden we have this amazing vaccine that is, is new. People don't have a really firm understanding of how something was created so quickly. And now you want us to take it when we, when our communities were suffering and, and, and being disproportionately impacted and experiencing the most cases and hospitalizations and deaths. So, so there is like this this, this this disconnect that I think that, you know, to say, oh, hey, we have this great vaccine, take it. It's really, hold on, take a step back and really talk and think about what is the relationship between communities and, and health and healthcare institutions. Do people, for example, like my barber, he does he doesn't have a physician. He doesn't have health insurance. Mm -hmm. Um, he didn't have anyone to talk to about the vaccine. He waited over a year to get vaccinated, but it's only be before that he actually reached out to me and we had several conversations and ultimately he got vaccinated. And he said, Uche, I don't have a doctor. You're the only doctor I know and I trust you. Yeah. And we I talked to him and his adult daughter and they eventually got vaccinated. But I think what that speaks to is how um, embedded the, and I hate to say the, 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 the mistrust is because, you know, the in, social institutions have not proven trustworthy, right? I mean, people talk about Tuskegee, but it's not just Tuskegee. It's what happens when you go seek care. You know, we, we have documented that Black patients' pain is undertreated within healthcare institutions, right? So, you know, and that, and that happens in the current day, right? So people, so there's already, there's this fractured relationship and then you're offering, um, you know, a, a, a brand new vaccine. And so I think for people, obviously like owning me, who we have a science background, you're like, yeah, of course, this, is, this vaccine is great. But I have, but the understanding is that people are living in different situations, um, you know, have different differential access to healthcare or and information also. That's the other thing. We always think about access to information. It's easier for someone to log online and get information from Facebook or WhatsApp group, right? So we have to think about, you know, what are the best ways to connect and engage mm -hmm. with communities um, to really make sure that we're getting accurate information out there. But we, we, would, we really would have wanted to form those bonds of trust before mm -hmm. a pandemic happened. But this just emphasizes that that, that needs to happen. No, exactly. Thank you so much. I have one final question for you, for you both. And I just wanted to, again, just say thank you so much for your time. Uh, we, we started this conversation talking a bit about, um, you know, it being Mother's Day. We talked about Dr. Dale Blackstock. We talked about, and Uche, you had mentioned today would have been, you know, her, her birthday as well. So my last question for you both, and I'll start with Oni. Um, if, if, if your mom, if Dr. Dale could could see Uche today and all the successes that she's had and everything, all the work she's done, what would she say to her? And then for you, uh, Uche, if your mom could see Oni today and all of the successes and everything that she's done with health equity, what would she say to her? So I'll start with you, Oni. Yeah, my, my mom would say, that's my baby girl. Like that's my <laughs> Uche. Um, you know, I think that our, our you know, our mom, her, her, you know, she, there was a lot in her life she wasn't able to do. And I think she looked at us often and thought that we were so, she's like, you're so much more mature than I was at your age. You're so much more diplomatic, whatever it is. So I almost feel like we, she kind of passed us the baton. And I think if she saw Uche, you know, MSNBC contributor, future author, um, business, business owner, um, she, she would, she would be completely like shocked, but not, but, but like not surprised. Like she, she knew that was always there. And um, she's just seeing sort of the fruition you know, of all the love and care that she invested in us. So I think she would be absolutely thrilled. Oh, yeah. No, I, I don't think I could say it um, any better, but um, you know, our mother would be um, over the top and proud, I think, of, of, of both of us, of, of both of us, because we can continue, we're continuing, continuing her legacy yes. and, and, you know, all of the, um, the values um, and purpose that um, she taught us, you know, growing up, we are trying to exemplify that and trying to continue that for her. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, with that last thought, thank you both so much for being a part of this conversation, for being um, here to, to chat. And thank you so much for sharing about your mother and about both of your experiences and, and about the work you do um, with, with health equity during this super important time in our lives. Um, so I just want to say thank you again to, do, to Dr. Oni Blackstock and Dr. Uche Blackstock for joining us today. Um, and thank you to the audience for asking some questions. 
<laughs> Thanks for our event sponsor, YouTube, and to all of you out there um, for taking the time to join us. The next virtual event in our 2022 Status List Spotlight series uh, will be taking place on July 26th. More information can be found on our website, but I just want to say thank you both again, and thank you all out there for joining us. Take thank care you. and stay thank safe. You. Thank you so much.